Hello, I'm Larry Wilson. Please join me for another five-minute Bible study. This is part two, The Games Demons Play. Even though demons have found a thousand different ways to tempt and torment people, the doorway to demonic torment and oppression never changes. When a person knowingly and willingly chooses to do wrong, God temporarily removes his hedge of protection, and demons are permitted to speak to us on the same spiritual channel that the Holy Spirit uses. When demons speak, they insert their evil ideas into our minds. Even though their ideas are temptations to do greater evil than we intended to do, their efforts may not be noticed at first because they are masters of gradualism. But after a while, if we continue to fall for their suggestions, the results will be clearly seen. When a person enters a state of passion, demons know that their evil suggestions are more likely to become actionable than if a person is in a state of happiness and contentment. Therefore, the demons constantly agitate people. This is one of their games. They watch for situations where greed, power, lust, sex, fear, anger, or revenge is present, and they use those to pounce on us. Demons know that dreadful consequences can occur when a person loses self-control. A man consumed with lust might rape a woman or abuse a child. A person consumed with anger can kill another person because of road rage. A woman can go out drinking and destroy an innocent family because she lost control of her car. So the demons lie in wait. Our misery and death is a serious game for them, and they have no mercy when they get a chance to cause suffering. Demons like to play the game of off and on, because this game makes it very difficult to detect their presence. For example, the first king of Israel, King Saul, would become very angry and violent at times. Truth is, Saul became a wicked man because he continually chose to do wrong. When the demons began to tempt him to commit greater evils, he drifted away from God's protection. Later, when he faced a great battle with the Philistines, he asked the Lord what he should do, but God refused to respond. Fearful and desperate, King Saul visited a medium, and a demon appeared that looked like Samuel. The demon totally demoralized the king, telling him that he would not survive. King Herod also suffered from the games that demons play when the wicked Herod sensed that his throne might be threatened by the birth of baby Jesus. He ordered the death of all baby males less than two years old in Bethlehem in an effort to kill Jesus. According to Revelation 12, the demons caused Herod to commit this awful crime. These two examples are important because demons are real, and their games are far more common and harmful than many people realize. Because we can't see the demons, many people scoff at the idea they exist. But those who have spiritual eyes and ears know that demonic activity is reported in the news every day. Demons are at work. They are more deadly than a sack full of rattlesnakes. They are more cruel and deviant than the religious leaders of ISIS. They are determined to cause great suffering and destruction, and they use their invisibility and their temptations to great advantage, especially on people who choose to knowingly and willfully do wrong. There is an important difference between mental illness and demonic oppression. And distinguishing between the two can be very difficult because demons will mimic mental illness to frustrate their victims and those who try to help them. Some people are sure they're demon-oppressed, when in fact they have mental problems. Some people think they have mental problems when in fact they have demonic problems. Generally speaking, if a person thinks he has a demonic problem and he wants to be set free, he should first go and get a physical and mental exam, 
to make sure that his underlying problem is not a medical one. If no mental or physical defect can be found, then he should seek out a godly person, a Christian counselor, or a member of the clergy who can discuss his problem in depth. Together they can seek the Lord for wisdom and understanding to determine how to proceed. Finally, you need to consider a very clever game that demons play. Demons know that bad company corrupts good character. But how do you place a bad person in the middle of good people? Suppose a popular musician is evil-minded. He advocates the use of illegal drugs, sexual immorality, and violence. Because the musician advocates evil behavior, demons speak often to him. They enhance his music and lyrics with their own evil thoughts. The musician sells a million records. Now suppose a few million teenagers buy the music inspired by demons. What will be the result? The young will listen and be impressed. They will follow after the musician on Facebook, thinking that his tunes are catchy and his lyrics are really cool. Once they memorize his music, they will be influenced by demons on the way life should be lived. And what will be the result? Millions of teenagers will grow up thinking that wrong is right and right is wrong, and when their generation begins to have children, what will the grandchildren know about good and evil? Can a person know God's ways and will if no one teaches him? Can a person have a true understanding of good and evil when he is ignorant of God's truth and rebellious toward his authority? Of course not, and the demons know it. This is why the demons have set up thousands of agents who work in the music industry and in the movie industry. And here's the irony. Most of the agents in these industries don't know they're working for the demons. What a brilliant game! Summarizing, if a person thinks he has a problem with demons, he should have a medical checkup to rule out physical or mental illness. If nothing is found, he should then seek out a godly counselor or a member of the clergy. The Bible says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Hebrews 10 and James 4 How do we come near to God? The first step is repentance, confessing and forsaking known sin. The second step is restitution. We have to make wrongs right. When we take these two steps, the transforming power of God will come into our lives and the demons will flee. The Lord will return his hedge of protection. If you wish to read more about this topic, please click on the link showing on the screen. We're out of time. If you have found this video helpful, please share it with your friends and hurry on to the conclusion.